Hello, Andy. Hi, Paul. Hi, how are you doing? Welcome to my den of iniquity. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> you look right at home here in an office. Yeah, well, you know, it's looking good at the moment. Hi, Paul. How, How are, are you? you? All right? Yeah, fine. What was that? That was um, a bit of one caress, one All of the right. songs we do. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Dave. How are you? Hi, Paul. It's been a long time to see you, and I, I think it is you, isn't it? Uh, this is yeah, it is me. Yeah, well, it's great. With your candle collection. <laughs> Well, my name's Gambaccini, and I'm Mr. here to Gambaccini. see Martin Gore. Right, one okay. moment, please. Hello, Mr. Gore. Oh, there's Mr. Gambaccini to see you. Thank you. Please, just go on right upstairs, number 16, first 16. Floor. <laughs> do, you, do you find sometimes with the uh, British right, critics man. that because they knew you when you were young and a poppy band that they don't take you seriously? I think, yeah, we've, we've always suffered from that slightly in England, but I think as the years go by it becomes less and less of a problem. I mean, you know, we're 13 years on now, so I mean, most of the people, I mean, even most of the journalists were too young to remember. As you look back over the uh, history of the group, which is now about 13 years, I guess. Talking about the history, I've been watching all the, the old videos. It's quite interesting. Well, you said you never, en never enjoyed actually doing them, but are there any that you're proud of having done? All of them, I think. Well, no, actually, all of the recent ones. I wouldn't say I'm proud of the early videos. I think we was used as a, an experiment for some dodgy ideas in some of those. But that was really at the start of uh, videos anyway, I mean, 1981, uh, that's when videos really started to be made really, didn't they? And uh, there was these storyboard videos and uh, type videos, and we, we had to do a lot of acting and we just wasn't really good at that. We realised that, you know, we wasn't going to be the new Beatles. It's getting harder, it's a If we were to look at key records in the history of the group, Just Can't Get Enough would be one of them. Wouldn't it? Obviously, that is the one, especially in Britain, which a lot of people still remember us for, which is a shame, really, because we've come, along, come on quite a way since then. Thank you. I don't want to believe everything I read, but uh, I did read once that you thought that People Are People, which was your breakout record in the States, was perhaps a bit too simplistic for your subsequent tastes. Do you think it was a bit uh, too preachy? Um, I just think it's not very, uh, yeah, it's just not, not very subtle and just, you know, it's probably my least favourite song out of all the ones we've ever done. What so, would be your favourite? Um, difficult. I mean, there's, you know, there's so many songs now. I really still like Shape with Disease. I still like Stripped because of certain atmospheres. I mean, but with this record, I think you can't really tell until, you know, at least a couple of years later. It's, you know, you're just you're too close to it. I never know until it's actually out. You know, I, I, with, even with, like, Violator, the last one, I wasn't sure if I even liked it until, like, a couple of, you know, a year or so after it was out. One advantage that you've had is that you've never been too associated with any particular musical trend, so therefore you don't go out of fashion when the fad does. Uh, do you find yourself listening to much music now that you live in America? Yeah, all the time. I listen to as much music as possible all the time. Everything, lots of things, classical stuff. And, and you know, and I find it, I think it's really important to get out and see b bands and go to gigs and, and listen to music and totally be involved in it all the time. 
Because otherwise you, it's, it's just too fake. As far as pop music goes, I don't tend to follow it. Um, I, I buy a lot of CDs and I listen to a lot of music in the car, for example, and, uh, and I watch things that I tape off TV, the specific things that I want to see. But uh, as, you know, I don't really just switch on the radio and have it in the background or, or follow the charts, really. Don't, I don't really have much interest in it. Like at the moment, I think everybody expects us to come out with a techno album, like a, you know, sort of like a hard dance album. But I think there's there's so much of that music around at the moment, and the songs really getting lost. So you know, I, I don't think I consciously sat down and tried to react against that. But I think it's just something that you do because, like you know, you listen to the radio, you go to clubs, and you're just like you know, sort of immersed in this same sort of music everywhere you go. That you go home, and, and for me, I think when I just sit down and write a song, it just comes out differently because I want to hear something different. It is fascinating, really, that you've each evolved into a, a different kind of role. One is the songwriter, one is mm. the singer, one is the technician. You're mm. the business person. Yeah, it's an amazing mixture. I think it's the modern, the way a modern band should be, really. Um, and I think if more bands were like that, they could they could run their affairs more successfully. You know. What's the evolution in your mind from having been at one point the new boy to now the keeper of the instrumental sound, if we may call it that? When did you realize that this particular responsibility was coming your way? Um, well, I suppose with, with experience, you, you want to take more control. You know, the more you learn, the more you realize that it, you can usually do something better yourself and put it into other people's hands. I've always had a, a strong interest in the production side of making music um, and that's just really evolved over the years. It seems that the way we've delegated roles within the group, so a natural delegation if you like, something that's happened without really us sitting down and deciding it, um, it's left that me with most of that responsibility um, and I enjoy that. I'd always written songs, you know, from the age of sort of 13 or so I started writing songs. So I had quite a, you know, not, not a lot, but a few songs in a back catalogue anyway. You know, I was just sort of thrown into it. And we, fortunately, we were young enough not to, not to worry about things. You know, I think if the same thing had happened to, to us today, we'd have probably, you know, been be going, oh my God, you know, what are we going to do now? Because like, you, you, I think as you get older, you tend to like, be more practical about things. But, you know, we just went straight back into the studio and didn't worry and, you know, fortunately just, things just turned out. I mean, I don't think the second album was a masterpiece, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I think it, you know, we just about got away with it. You find yourself in a position like that of Roger Daltrey in The Who, who sang the songs written by Pete Townsend. This successful relationship with Martin has been going on for so many years now. Have it ever given you a chance to reflect on what kind of mental or spiritual relationship you have with this man? <laughs> Over the last couple of years, I think I've, I've felt a lot closer to Martin. I've got to know him a lot better. I've liked him a lot more. I'd like to think he felt the same about me. Um, and I feel, I don't know, in some way really close to his songs. When I was ex wanting something else, you know, he'd write that song. Um, no, I really love singing Martin's man. Martin, Martin's a brilliant songwriter. Um, and I'd like to think that the rest of us, you know, Alan and myself and uh, Fletch, bring out the best of those songs. Who were your early favourite songwriters? Or, or did you even have any? Did it just come out of you? Um, I mean, there, there were people that, that I really, you know, was influenced by when I, when I was growing up. I think, you know, I, I really used to like Gary Glitter. You know, I think that, that was my main sort of, uh, sort of inspiration when I was sort of 13, 14, 12, 13, 14, when uh, you're probably your most influential. And uh, then when I got a little bit older, I got into people like, I really liked Jonathan Richman, things like that, you know probably a bit strange really it's not I think it's what people expect me to like do you think that as many people of the current generation want to make music as did of yours and if not what was it that was special 
in your mind that encouraged you to do this? Well, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure there's many people, just as many people now that are interested in making music as there were when I was growing up, you know. Uh, the reason I got involved is really it was because it was in the family. I was encouraged by my parents to, to learn the piano, which I did as a young lad. And, um, and that just evolved into interest in popular music as opposed to classical music, which presumably they expected me to be interested in or to follow my brothers, really. My two brothers are both pianists. And um, I was sort of expected to follow the suit, you know. But for some reason, I got interested in blues music and rock and roll. Well, I can't help but notice that it is three years since Violator. Does this mean that you're writing less or just recording less? I think, you know, we have to get things right. After, you know, I can't remember what it is now, 10 albums or so, it just takes longer until everybody's happy with the, the end result. You know, your standards go up. And also, you've tried so many things that, you know, you, you, to, to be experimental and, and do things that are, uh, you know, different for us just takes longer. There's been big changes in, in each individual member of the group, which I couldn't sum up in a few sentences, but um, particularly over the last few years, I think, um, since we've sort of got to, to our 30s kind of thing, and then and you can see every, within everybody that certain aspects of their life, their lives have become much more important to them. And, um, you know, what with having had um, a significant break away from each other before we started making this record, when we came back together, you could really see the changes with everybody. Really during the making of that record and, and then touring with it and a lot of things changed in my life. Um, I found myself sort of breaking down a lot of things that were no longer sort of giving me any, anything at all, apart from heartache and grief, to be quite honest. So um, I tried to change everything and uh, I fell in love and flew away to another country and um, got married and everything and started a new life, really. Of course, I've noticed that uh, between us and slightly behind us, there is a large drum kit. Mm. And I gather that uh, you've been doing a bit of practicing. Yeah, I've got a, quite a lot more practicing to do as well. If I'm uh, to play them live, which is what I'm going to attempt to do on the next tour, on certain songs, not all the songs. Condemnation is a riveting sounding track. I must admit, when I first heard it, I thought, oh my god, have I got this on at the wrong speed? Because uh, it starts very <laughs> slowly. Uh, you must have had a lot of fun working on that one. Yeah, but that, that isn't one of the tracks that we, that we used you know, other people on, or, or backing singers, gospel singers, but it is actually sung in, in a very sort of gospel quartet style, an old gospel quartet style. And you know, we basically worked out the parts and sang them you know, and you know, did, you know, we didn't sort of sample vocals off. We just sang the parts like a, like like a quartet. So it was, yeah, it was, you know, very, very interesting to do that. And I think Dave has given his best vocal performance ever on that track. We managed to find a good environment. We did that particular vocal in Madrid, and um, the house we'd set up the studio up had a, a very echoey tiled room down in the garage. And he sang down there, and he enjoyed singing in that space. You know, just the way the room set off the sound of his voice um, was pleasing to him and, and therefore he sang well. In Condemnation, you're all singing along. Mm. Do you enjoy taking part? M most of the time that's not me, Paul. My voice has been criticised unfairly so, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you don't uh, fight for the others, but No, the others are basically... The others. <laughs> Martin and Alan are so uh, they're very very red hot with their harmonies and uh, I get criticised a lot, you know, my voice isn't up to it really. I think it's better than they think it is. <laughs> Martin said that he thought that Condemnation was your best vocal performance to date. Do you feel good about that track? To me that song I, is definitely the, the best, best vocal that I've ever, the best lyrics I think and, and melody that I've ever been given to sing. No, that, that's a song that I, I, I wish I could have written, you know. It was one of the first songs that we done, sung really out in Madrid. 
I just felt everything that I was saying was making sense and, and it was kind of breaking down and crushing or opening up new new things for me, you know, um, and breaking down old things and it was like getting to the end of it. And when I heard it back, I just thought, you know, that sound great. And Flood and everybody in the studio and it was like, I could tell. There was a feeling when I walked back in the control room and everybody was like, that was really good. That's the first song I would like and would have liked everybody to hear first because um, I just think we captured something really, really special. How do you improve your voice after having been on record for many albums now? Uh, Wouldn't you like to know, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> I've always thought of the band as having a European influence and appealing to Europeans. Sorry. Who is it? It's me. It's me. We're, we're uh, um, filming. Well, what's going yeah. on with, with time's money? I mean, Sorry. should I come back later then, or what? Just. Oh. Should Sorry. I come back later? Um, just in a bit. In a bit. Oh. <laughs> Martin, what are you doing? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I. I always thought of the band <laughs> as uh, having a European influence and uh, appealing to Europeans. Would you agree with that? Um, no, I don't think so at all. I think we used to think that, but um, yeah, I think the you know our success in America has really sort of you know, sh shown that up to be false. You know, we sell just as many records in America now as we do in you know in Europe put together. Well, the four of you do work together, and, and it is noteworthy that after all this time, uh, there hasn't been somebody saying, I'm going off and doing my own thing, or the three of them saying, you're not carrying your own weight, mm -hmm. leave. This happens with so many groups. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's because you were fortunate enough to find your own tasks, or is it just some sort of special chemistry? Um, I think most successful groups have a sort of unique blend, if you like, that, that chemistry thing. Um, and I'm sure we do have that. Um, but we also have had the type of problems that you talk about. It's just that you don't hear about it, I'm sure. Um, you always have internal wrangles. You always have internal problems. Um, there isn't a group that, that exists that hasn't had that. And we, we're no different in that respect. But you know, we tend to keep that kind of thing fairly private because it's not for anyone else's you know, ears, really. Um, but generally speaking, we've managed, as you say, to delegate and allocate our roles in quite a unique way, in a way that works. And most of the time, we're, we're happy like that. Do you find you get on just as well as ever? I think so. I mean, obviously, we, we have had disagreements, and after you know, 13 years, it's, you know, you know everybody's personality so well and uh, when, when there are disagreements, you know, you can predict how they're going to go. But, uh, you know, I think we get on as well as you can after 13 years, which is, you know, it, that makes it sound bad, but we actually get on well. Uh, to be honest, I feel a little bit sad that um, I haven't become much closer with the three other people that I work with and have worked with for a lot of years. I'd like to have changed some of the things that we've done and um, in the, you know, our relationship. To me, it's really, really important what we have. Um, the whole atmosphere that Veshmo creates when they're in a room together and as much as sometimes I fucking hate it, you know, I love it so much as well, and each person I love as well. Were there ever moments when you've been on stage and you'd find yourself watching Dave? Yeah, many moments, you know, when, um, I mean, it, he, what he does on stage is, is very difficult, and um, I, I try and, to encourage him, you know, or, or to at least let him know that, you know, I value what he does on stage because he really does take the brunt of the attention, and it's a very difficult thing to do. There's very few 
good front men around. And I think he does it well. As we contemplate your stage act, uh, I'm reminded that many people now have genuine designers work on their stage sets. And uh, would, Will you be going in this direction? Well, we always work in conjunction with other people when we're putting stage shows together. Anton's working on, on this particular stage set with us. And um, we'll be looking to him for some very strong ideas. Uh, Plus, we're trying to put as much thought to it as we can in, uh, to try and do it in a very different way than we have before, which is generally how we approach most things. Martin, before I say anything else, I've got to tell you, I'm knocked out by this guitar. Is it one you've had for a while? Yeah, it, I've, had it, I've had it now for about five years or so. It's actually uh, my favourite guitar. You know, I've got quite a collection now, and we try them all for every guitar part in the studio, and I always go back to this one. So. What's special about it? It's just a very sort of full sound. It's, it's quite old, I think. It's you know, sort of early 60s or something. I remember the excitement in concert when you came forward to play a guitar piece. Will you be using the guitar more in the show, do you think? With every album, I think, you know, we, we incorporate more guitar parts just because it seems more natural. So, uh, I mean, I have to perform live then. You know, I actually enjoy it as well. I mean, I, I think we've, we've managed to sort of get a good balance between rock and electronics, I don't think the show is over rocky, uh, which was always our worry. And, but it's, I think it just adds a new dimension to the show when I actually come forward instead of like, you know, the three of us being stuck behind keyboards. And I think we're going to try and sort of do more of that sort of thing on the next tour with drums and stuff. You say you've been dissuaded from singing. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever wanted to write? I've tried writing again. I've been in a band with two of you know, the best modern day songwriters, really, and it doesn't really do much for your confidence, you know, if you present a song and uh, it's not really up to scratch. Mm. So I, I basically gave up and sort of concentrated on what I thought was good at, what I was good at. Dave, I have to say this, as you've been animated in our conversation, and your tattoos have seemed to come to life, and I suppose this is... <laughs> oh, don't say that, for fuck's sake. <laughs> this is probably the best chance we'll ever have to have a guided tour of these tattoos, if you don't mind. Uh -huh. Could you uh, explain well, what you're new? What you're they, all, they all kind of all tell a story, really, to me. They all mark some kind of personal change or something that went on in my life, right from the first one that I had. I had very young. I had another one here that was that I'd removed just because I didn't like it. At that time, I thought about getting both of them removed. But um, yeah, there's been some other things done. They all kind of mark events, really. But it's uh, personal. And they're kind of like, it's like my war paint, really. Mm. I've got some more done yet before we go on tour. <laughs> you certainly seem to have trusted Flood, with whom you've been working as a producer. Now, for four guys who are so relatively protective, how did he come to win your trust? Um, well, Flood's become a very important part of our team over the last two records. Um, we really needed the change from the production team we had been working with before that. And it was suggested to us that we try and work with Flood, who had a good knowledge of electronics and synthesizers, but also had a very good uh, sort of perspective as a producer, and was probably someone we could get on with. And so we just entered into um, an album with him, and it, it sort of clicked from there. And as I say, he's now become a crucial member of our team, and his contribution is vast. Now that the novelty of making videos has worn off, do you find this a genuine outlet for your artistic expression, or is it just a chore? Well, to be honest, there was never any novelty in making videos. We, we hated making them from the, uh, the very first one, and it, it wasn't until we started working with Anton that we actually you know, started liking to make them. And, you know, just, I, I think, you know, we, we always felt that we could never trust the directors. And, you know, I mean, I mean, you're totally in the director's hands. You've got no idea how it's looking when you're filming it. You, uh, you know, you basically don't see it until it's finished. And then by that time, it's too late to change anything. And it's basically, it's got to go out. So, you know, for our first, I don't know, 15 videos or whatever, we, we, we pretty much hated them. And, you know, now, we, you know, we've, we've got it. We've got into this sort of routine of working with Anton, and uh, we're, 
you know, we, he, he explains things to us, and we, also because we have this trust in what he's doing, you know, we know the end result is going to be quite good, which makes it a lot more enjoyable to actually film. the religion and the sex thing, I, I think they've always been very tied in for me. And like, even like the, the album title is Songs of Faith and Devotion, which has like a very strong you know, sort of religious leaning to it. And we wanted to portray that in the title, but it's also fairly ambiguous in that, you know, faith, faith in what and devotion to what. Well, you've now agreed on I Feel You as, yeah. as the first single. And uh, was this a pretty general consensus? No, nothing is these days. No, we had, uh, this, the trouble with this album, we've got so, seem to have so many different options. We just felt, I feel you made you know, the right sort of statement. It's full of head, it's, you know, right in your face. Um, that's what it's supposed to be. And it's pretty sexual and, uh, you know, it's got a really heavy feel about it. It's not actually my choice for what I think should be the first single, or what we present to people as our first recording, if you like. Um, but I understand why people think it should be. <laughs> Have you got any ideas yet for what you'll be doing for I Feel You? Uh, no, he's too slow. <laughs> <laughs> we, we gave him the tape a few weeks ago, he hasn't come up with anything yet. <laughs> 